All right, y'all. Uh, I got a video for y'all today. I just want y'all to check it out, and then I'm gonna come back for comments. 11-year-old Ivir is Tama's oldest child. He and his seven-year-old sister, Aylin, live with Tama and her grandmother, Tilly. I called her phone, and she didn't pick up. And I just thought, you know, it's some big, she's probably just out there doing something with somebody. Grandma. Grandma. Where's mom? Is she not here? I looked all over her house. She's like, no, where's At this that point, girl? as a kid, I My mother scared, called so. and she said, where's your daughter? Come get these DAM kids. I said, okay, well, just wait a minute, mama. Let me try to find her. I called her phone. Give me a call as soon as you get this message, okay? With the voicemail, there was a red flag right there because she always answers her phone. After failing to reach Tama by phone, Tama's mother, Ramona, continues searching for her. I started calling my friends, and I had some start praying, and I started calling her friends, her cousins. We were just calling constantly because it wasn't like her not to answer the phone or not to show up at home. 24 hours pass, and there's still no sign of Tama Graves. At that point, her mother, Ramona, decides to contact the authorities. When I told them who she was, and it was one of their own, they got right on it. Tama was a victim's advocate at the Franklin County Courthouse, and everyone in the Franklin County Courthouse knew Tama. She had great relationships with her co-workers. But as this mystery slowly unfolds in the days to come, folks in Frankfurt will get a cold, hard reminder that bad things can happen to good people in the most horrific ways imaginable. It was just terrible, and no one deserved that. Born to a loving and gregarious mother, Tama Graves was a lifelong Kentuckian. Tama was born in Frankfort, Kentucky on March the 5th, 1973. As a child, Tama had a laser-like focus on her schoolwork. Tama was very serious about education. Tama really excelled in high school. She was at the top of her class and ready to take the next step and go off to college. After high school, Tama enrolled at Kentucky State University, where she stood out for both her brains and her beauty. Tama was a beautiful girl. She was tall, big, pretty smile. She was very attractive. It wasn't long before Tama caught the attention of one of the most eligible bachelors on campus. Hello, pretty lady. How you doing? Hi, how are you? Now it's the next Tama met a young, handsome football player by the name of Alistair Couch. You have the most amazing legs on campus. Oh, really? Yeah, everybody says so. Oh, everyone? Everybody. Alistair Couch was raised in Memphis, Tennessee, and was very active in football. Alistair was tall and handsome. When he walked into a room, everyone noticed him and paid attention. He had that swag about him. Alistair Couch had a sense of charm to him. He was a ladies' man. Though Tama was well aware of Alistair's playboy reputation, there was something about him she couldn't resist. And Alistair felt the same way about Tama. She was a strong woman. She held her own. And he really liked that about her. Tama had big dreams. She was planning to go back to get her MSW. She was very uh, goal-oriented and very career-driven. During Tama's last two years of undergrad, she and Alistair were hot and heavy. But when graduation rolled around, Tama had to make a hard choice about her future. Tama graduated undergrad with a degree in social work. Well, now comes graduate school, but that would mean she would have to move away. So there was a choice between her romance with Alistair or her budding career. She chose her career. Tama was very ambitious with her career. She really enjoyed Frankfurt, but she also wanted to know what else was out there in the world. She decided to take a trip to California in search of graduate school prospects. While out there, Tama met the man that would change her life. Hey, let me help you with that. You'll be with that. I got you. I got you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I'm good. Thank you. For Edward and Tom, it appeared to be love at first sight. You know, this might be a little weird, but I really think you're beautiful. Okay. Thank like you. Again, yeah, you can see me again. Tom and Edward were inseparable. She actually stayed in California to be with him and spend more time with him and get to know him better. 
He was a hardworking professional man and Tama was hardworking. So professionally, they were on the upswing. Tama and Edward spent a lot of time together and eventually Tama and Edward took their relationship to the next level and she found out that she was pregnant. In 1999, Tama gave birth to her and Edward's first child, young Ivir. Four years later, they welcomed the birth of their second child, a girl named Island. Tama was a very good mother. She loved her children. She would read to them, spend a lot of time with them, go to the parks. I mean, she was an awesome mother. My mom was a good mom. I just, I just loved her. She was awesome to me. But despite her successful career and picture-perfect family life, Tama longed to be back in Kentucky. And in 2007, the opportunity to return home presented itself. Tama was offered a job in her hometown and felt like it was something she couldn't pass up. Tama decided to come back to Frankfurt, and that really started her and Edward's long-distance relationship. Tama started working at the Franklin County Courthouse. She became a victim's advocate. She would serve to communicate with victims of trials or of crimes. We're going to do everything we can here to help you with your children. The victim's advocate is the person that can kind of help them to understand the process of what may be going on in the court system or how to stay safe or what to do moving forward. She had that calm, kind of laid back personality that, that would put people at ease. Tom was really good with people. She's plain spoken, not in your face kind of stuff, but, but she stood her ground. What we try to do with, with victims of violence is remind them that, that they're in charge. You know, they're people who have gone through a really rough time and, and, and they're gonna be stronger for it. You know, you're the strong, we're just here to support you. But as Tama's career took off, her relationship with Edward began to flounder. He was so far away, long distance relationship, it just wasn't gonna work probably. So they just kinda went their separate ways, I guess. So they both decided that it's time for them just to be friends so she could focus on her career and focus on the kids here in Frankfurt. But in the summer of 2010, just a few weeks after she and Edward called it quits, Tama goes missing. It was so unlike Tama. No one knew or could find out where she was. We just didn't know what had happened to her. And it kind of put fear into us. As detectives race to find Tama, a devastating discovery shifts the focus of their search. He saw what he thought to be a dead man's body lying in the vehicle. Homicide detectives are called to the scene and they are completely shocked. August 1st, 2010. It's been more than 24 hours since 37-year-old single mother Tama Graves disappeared in her hometown of Frankfort, Kentucky. Tama Graves was a victim's advocate in the Frankfort court system, and everyone knew her and adored her, loved her. For her to just disappear like this was shocking. Just wasn't like her not to answer her phone. It was already a red flag, and all I could do was remember just praying and praying and begging and praying to God, Let's just please let her answer her phone. Unfortunately, every call to Tama goes unanswered, and nobody has any idea where she is. A missing persons report is filed with authorities, and now everyone is looking for her. As the search for Tama ramps up, police begin piecing together a timeline of the hours prior to her disappearance. According to Tama's family, the last time anyone had spoken to her was early Saturday morning. Tama's cousin Lorraine reported that she had called somewhere between 8 and 9 that morning. So did Tama sound okay? Or were you aware of any new problems in her life? No, I I can't really say. But she did sound a little depressed when I talked to her. Oh, really? Yes. We talked about having lunch that afternoon, but she never showed. For investigators, the possibility that Tama may have been depressed raises an alarm. Her job was very stressful, and she's raising two young children on her own. Maybe this was intentional. I said, maybe she's depressed or something. She's checked in a place or something. And I was praying that that was what it was. But while police check area clinics and hospitals, others close to Tama find it hard to believe she ever hurt herself. i just seen it Friday. We talked about her plans, you know, and, and she, was, she was real excited about how things moving on in her life. She, she loved her kids, loved her family. But this also raises the question, if Tama didn't hurt herself, did someone else hurt her? And no one 
has seen her. Is she alive or dead? Nobody knows. As questions continue to mount, on August 2nd, 48 hours after Thomas' disappearance, a local resident makes a startling discovery. Call the police. A woman reported seeing a white Chevy Silverado in the parking lot of the downtown funeral home. She said it had been parked there a couple of days and the driver's side window was shattered. She had a friend approach the vehicle and he saw what he thought to be a dead man's body lying in the vehicle. They thought it was a possible suicide. Tyler drives a white truck similar to the one in the 911 call. The police think, though, that if this is a man in the driver's seat, then it isn't Tommy. But when police arrive at the funeral home, they're stunned. It wasn't a man slumped dead in the vehicle. It was a woman. Oh, wow. Is that who I think that is? Yeah, it is. It's Grace. Thomas' body was found in her truck on a Monday morning. They weren't sure at the time how long she had been there how she got there, or any other details. She appears to have been the victim of a single gunshot wound to the head. Police aren't sure whether the wound was self-inflicted or otherwise. As investigators secure the vehicle, officers at the station receive a call from Thomas' family. On that Monday, I called Frankfurt Police. I'm calling about my daughter. And I was asking them, you know, have you heard anything about my daughter? And they said, we found her. I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. I said, so how is she? Is she okay? And the police officer said, ma'am, she's deceased. I fell off the bed and said, my baby's dead. Her mom was heartbroken. Her family was, was stunned. My grandmother told us that my mom was deceased. And then my brother, he kind of looked really sad when I looked up at him. I just broke down and started crying, really. I was like a zombie till I realized when all I kept saying was, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. I don't know what happened, but I'm going to take care of you. <gasps> My baby. As the Grace family struggles to deal with this devastating news, back at the scene, CSI have begun analyzing the blood evidence inside Thomas' truck. What they discover will cast even more doubt over the case and send those closest to Tama recoiling in shock and horror. There are a lot of secrets that no one could even ever imagine. In this story, the secrets were deadly. All I heard was her screaming, and I was just like, my mom was blank. I was thinking, what happened? And then she was looking down, and there were tears coming down her face. I knew it could have been anything else but my mom. I mean, my heart was broken, really. I just didn't know what was going to happen after that. I spent nine years trying to get... Three days after Tama Graves was reported missing to Frankfort, Kentucky police, the 37-year-old victim's advocate and mother of two is found dead in the driver's seat of her truck. We were standing there with a couple of female employees in the office. They immediately started crying. It was a sad, sad day. It was obviously devastating for everyone involved, and there was some initial suspicion that this could be a suicide because of the single gunshot wound to the head. But as CSI's process, the capital, they did not find a weapon. There was a gunshot to the head, and there was one through the hand, which the medical examiner described as a defensive type wound. With Thomas' death now officially classified a homicide, Investigators double their efforts to identify Thomas' killer. They're looking for fingerprints. They're looking for bullet fragments. Anything that they can gather that might connect the murder to an individual. The medical examiner recovered two 357 slugs from Thomas' body. So she was shot multiple times. The two 357 slugs are sent to the crime lab for analysis. But even though detectives know how Tama was murdered, they're still unsure who did it and why. You have to ask yourself, Tama working in the court system was coming in contact with very violent men. Could one of them have come back and retaliated against her? Officers scour court records for potential suspects. Meanwhile, investigators dig into Tama's personal life for possible leads. As far as who they talked to, 
the people that are closest, people that are in a relationship with the victim, uh, people, the last people known to be around the victim. The police asked questions. Do you know anybody she was dating? I didn't really know about her dating life. Tama never talked about her personal romantic life at all. Uh, at all. It was a close book. Though Tama was guarded about her love life, it's no secret that she recently split from Edward, the father of her two children. Though the split with Edward was amicable, Tama was the one who initiated it. Could he have been angry? Could he have been jealous? Investigators begin looking into the possibility that Thomas' ex, Edward, had killed her. But they soon find out he has an airtight alibi. It was determined that he was at home in California. This was corroborated by friends, family members, and co-workers. But if Edward wasn't responsible for Thomas' murder, was there another man in Thomas' life who might be? One of Thomas' closest friends, Christy Swainson, helped shed some light on that subject. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Oh, absolutely. You know, Thomas, she was my best friend. You know, I'd do anything for her. Christy was able to share something with the police that few people knew. And that was after she broke up with her ex, Edward. She reconnected with her old boyfriend, Alistair Couch. So even after all of those years apart, Thomas still carried a torch for Alistair. And shortly afterwards, they started seeing each other. Tama and Alistair kept their intimate relationship very secret. On August 11th, detectives bring Alistair Couch in for an interview. Police aren't sure if Alistair is a suspect, but they think he may be able to shed some light on who might have killed Tama. You know, if you got a problem with anybody, anything like that? No, sir. I don't know. Why would somebody kill Tama? That's what I want to know. That's what I'm know. curious about. When he was first interviewed by the police, he was polite, but he told the police that he had um, had a relationship with Tama in the past, basically said they had hooked up, that they were not in a relationship. In fact, Alistair admits Tama was just one of several women he was currently seeing. Apparently, while he was hooking up with Tama, he had two other ladies on the side. His main squeeze was Jesse Roberts and his other lady was Jamie Saunders. Jesse, kid long hair, slender build. Jamie had great bubbly personality. He would spend one day with Jesse. The next day, he may be riding around with Jamie. And then the day after that, spending time with uh, Tama and the kids. But Alistair tells police Tama had no problem with him seeing multiple women. We've never had an argument, never had a problem. Though they believe Alistair is telling the truth, investigators ask him point blank if he had anything to do with Thomas' death. He said he had nothing to do with the murder, wasn't anywhere near her, um, hadn't seen her in a few days. Where were you at, let's say, Friday night? The hospital, my own, one of my other girlfriend's mother had died, and I was with her. Alistair met Jamie at the hospital when her mom was in there. Detectives are able to confirm that Alistair actually is at the hospital with Jamie and her family on this Friday evening during this time frame. But investigators know Alistair's visit to the hospital only accounts for a portion of the weekend. I've got you through midday Saturday now, so I'm just curious where you were Saturday evening and uh, Saturday night. On Saturday evening, Alistair says that he's with his other girlfriend, Jesse, and that they spend the entire evening together. He indicated that he had been in her house that morning. He stayed at her place probably Saturday night? Yes, sir. Sunday morning. How long time you get up? Mm, like maybe 12 or something. 11, 12. I think we went to, um, we've actually went to a water park. Did the water park all day. Jesse told investigators that her and Alistair were at a amusement park on Sunday, August 1st, the same weekend that Tama was murdered. So the story is kind of starting to check out. Though Alistair Couch appears to have a solid alibi, his interview has provided investigators with a slew of other potential suspects. Alistair Couch had a few females uh, at one time, so we thought about the possibility of maybe it could have been a jealous female that did this. But no sooner have detectives started working the jealousy angle, the case takes an unexpected turn. 
One that sends Frankfurt police searching for one of the most feared gangsters in the city. One who's romantically involved with Tama Graves. In the days after Tama Graves' brutal murder, police had discovered that the dedicated victim's advocate and single mother of two had recently reignited a secret romantic relationship with her old college flame, Alistair Couch. It was very secretive. Her family didn't know him, didn't know his name, knew nothing about him. After interviewing Alistair at the station, investigators determined his alibi checks out. However, Alistair also revealed that he was dating several other women in addition to Tama, including Jesse Roberts and Jamie Saunders. Police need to find out everything they can about these women to determine if they were involved. After wrapping up their interview with Alistair, they decide to run background checks on Jesse Roberts, Jamie Saunders, and Alistair himself. What the background check reveals is truly shocking, at least as far as Alistair is concerned. Alistair Couch was a known drug offender. Alistair had a pretty extensive criminal background from robbery to cocaine selling to battery and kidnapping. It's now clear to investigators why Tama Graves had kept her relationship with Alistair such a secret. Tama was working at the county attorney's office as a victim's advocate, and that was just something you didn't do. You didn't date drug dealers when you're a victim's advocate. You don't date criminals. So before police can start looking into Jamie Saunders and Jesse Roberts as possible suspects, they must first run down this drug in. Frankfurt investigators take to the streets and begin working the case's new drug angle. But they immediately hit a roadblock. Few people in Frankfurt's drug underworld want to talk about Alistair Couch. He has a serious reputation. He was a gangster-style drug dealer. He was very intimidating. People were scared of him. He was known to carry at least two guns. People on the street may be frightened of Alistair, but another name kept popping up as well. That of Jesse Roberts, one of Alistair's girlfriends. Jesse did have his name tattooed on her back. They were, I would say, in a, a fairly steady relationship. She was the one who uh, visited him in, in jail or put money on his books. Jesse Roberts has the most to gain from Tama Graves' murder. Jesse probably could have possibly hated Tama but just for the simple reason that she was the other woman. On August 12th, investigators bring Jesse Roberts in for questioning. Thank you for coming and talking to us today. I understand you and Alistair Couch are pretty tight. How long have you two been together? For about a year or so. And were you aware that you were seeing other women? <laughs> yeah, I'm aware of her. So, you must have been unhappy to find out that your man was seeing another woman, especially someone as well put together as Miss Graves. Who? Wait a minute, wait a minute. The only chick I know that Alistair was seeing was Jamie Saunders. She said she didn't even know Tama Graves, never had heard of her name, didn't know anything about her. Is Jesse telling the truth? At this point, detectives still aren't sure. They know that Alistair was with Jamie Saunders Friday night and Tama went missing Saturday. So where was Jesse Roberts that day? According to Jesse, she was at her day job all day. She's an administrative assistant. So detectives went to check out her story. Detectives try to lock in where Jesse is, specifically during the time of Tonka's death, and they figure out that she's actually at work during the time that she was killed. So this eliminates Jesse as a suspect. Another promising lead has fallen short, but just as one door closes, others open up. There was enough word on the street that Alistair and some other individuals were in conflict in reference to drug activity in town. There were other individuals who had made statements about wanting a little revenge. Was there a drug war brewing in quaint little Frankfurt? And if so, could Tama Graves have been collateral damage? There was evidence to indicate that because of some drug activities, that there were some individuals who wanted to eliminate Alistair. Could it be possible that it was one of Alistair's enemies that had come to exact revenge on him and that she got caught in the crossfire? If this were an orchestrated hit or a drug-related murder for hire, 
the case might be a little bit more difficult to solve. A conspiracy involving several suspects sometimes makes it harder to connect the dots. Thankfully, investigators are about to catch a break. A surprise witness will come forward, and doing so will blow the lid off the entire investigation. One of the witnesses told detectives that they had seen a black man running in the same area that Thomas' truck was found. According to the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, there are roughly 32,000 gun deaths per year in the United States. Of those, about 34% are classified as homicides. Seven-year-old Tama Graves was found. The hunt for her killer has taken police in Frankfort, Kentucky into uncharted waters, namely the city's underground drug trade. There was some talk on the street that Tama's secret lover, a known drug dealer, Alistair Couch, was involved in a feud with some rival dealers. And it very well could be that this cost Tama her life. Drug-related assassinations are hard to solve because no one wants to speak out. They fear for their lives. Finally, an individual comes forward, a local florist named Keith Davis, who claims to have information about Thomas' death. Well, I'm standing here behind this desk here. I saw a black male run across a parking lot over there. One of the witnesses that came forward told detectives that they had seen a black man running in the same area that her truck was found. According to the witness, the black male seemed to be carrying a t-shirt with blood all over it. He jumped in the passenger side of a red truck. He and the other guy, they took off. Can you describe either of these men? The one that was running, he looked like he was late 20s, early 30s. Yeah. Medium build, average height. Who did this red truck belong to? Who were the men leaving the scene? Was the bloody shirt, did it belong to Tama? The answer to that question would remain a mystery until another crucial witness comes forward. Police finally get the break that they need when another witness comes forward with some additional information. He was a farmer from Frankfurt, um, just a good old country boy. The man's name is Rusty, and as it turns out, Rusty knows the identity of the man seen fleeing the scene with a bloody shirt. Rusty also identifies himself as the driver of the mysterious red truck. The man had contacted him and asked him to pick him up downtown near Washington uh, and Main Street. He was wound up. He got on the phone and said, come get him, man. Come get him, come get him. But it's the identity of the caller that's the biggest shocker. Rusty tells police that the man he picked up that day was Alistair Couch. Rusty's connection with Alistair was that he used to buy marijuana from him. Rusty tells the police that he was actually supposed to be buying marijuana from Alistair that morning. When he gets there, Alistair gets into the car with a bloody t-shirt and a bloody cell phone. What's going on? Drive, man. Just drive. He wants Rusty to drive fast, dodging, weaving in and out of traffic. He wants him to run red lights. He looked over and he said, he had to call some other friends for a ride from Rusty's girlfriend's home. They pick him up and they drive him to the country. What did he do with the gun? He took it with him. Rusty identifies one of the friends with Alistair as Brent Willis. Within hours, Willis is seated in front of investigators. Can you tell us what happened after you picked him up at Rusty's? Yeah, he was acting real paranoid. His, his eyes were bulgy like he was on drugs or something. He said, drive me to the country, and they did. He gets out of the car, and he throws something. This gun, I think he threw it off a cliff down by a river. The police searched the banks, and they found the gun. It was a 357 Ruger revolver, the exact weapon that police believe was used to kill Tama Graves. The discovery leaves little doubt in investigators' minds who killed Tama Graves. The question now is why? What was Alistair's motive? Did it have something to do with drug dealing? Was Tama going to expose him? Was it something else? Investigators believe if they can find Alistair and arrest him, they can get the answers to these questions. Thankfully, investigators don't have to look far to find Alistair Couch. 
In the time between Thomas' murder and the issuance of a warrant for Alistair's arrest, he had been previously arrested on an unrelated drug charge and was currently sitting in the county jail. Even with Alistair behind bars, police still have to find out the motive. Prosecutors needed to find someone willing to come forward to explain why this murder took place. Without it, there would be little chance to have justice for Tama Graves and her grieving family. October 8, 2010. A grand jury in Frankfort, Kentucky formally indicts Alistair Couch for the murder of Tama Graves. I just want to know why does he take a life like that? You know, what does she do deserve that? That's a question authorities need to answer if they are going to secure a conviction against Alistair. Investigators knew if they wanted to solve the case, they have to come up with a motive. Once again, detectives turn to one of the other women in Alistair's life, his main squeeze, Jesse Roberts. They think that she may know something, so they're going to ask her to testify at trial and explain why she thinks or knows that Tama will be murdered by Alistair Couch. Jesse did not want to testify. In fact, she hired an attorney uh, to represent her and asked the court uh, to uh, keep her from having to testify. How do you know the defendant, Alistair Couch? I respectfully decline to answer that question on the grounds that my answer may intend to incriminate me. I claim my rights under the Fifth Amendment. Even though she knew that he was in a relationship with Jamie and with Thomas, she still stood by his side. Thankfully for prosecutors, the presiding judge orders that she be available to testify at trial. She was subpoenaed to testify. The judge ruled that it would be necessary for her to testify. On July 6, 2011, the murder trial of Alistair Couch gets underway. Prosecutors open their case by alleging that on the morning of July 31st, 2010, Alistair shot his lover inside her truck. It was a strong case from an evidentiary standpoint. It was a very strong case. They had good witnesses who could testify and say, hey, this man threw this gun outside this window. This man had a bloody T-shirt and had a bloody cell phone that he set on fire. But in their opening statement, the defense points out the one glaring flaw with the state's case, the apparent lack of motive. They had evidence tying him to the scene, but they never explained, they never attempted to explain any reason that he would do that. In fact, Alistair's defense team is so emboldened by the state's inability to prove motive, they decide to roll the dice and call Alistair to the stand in his own defense. State your name, please. Alistair Martell Couch. He actually took the stand and testified during the trial in his own defense. And that's when we heard his version of what he said had happened, which he said that he and Tama had met up that morning. She came to your house? Yes, sir. Okay. What'd y'all do when she got there? We talked. Mm, we ate breakfast. I went to let the dogs out. But according to Alistair, that's when things got crazy. So Alistair said they go out that day and they were actually assaulted by a masked man. She was in the truck already. When I was getting in the truck, um, a guy come from behind the truck with a gun, put the gun to my back and told me to get in the car. Hey, baby, get in the car, man. What you doing? Get in the car. Get in the car, man. Alistair says that the guy with the gun ordered Tama to drive, and Alistair tried to grab the gun. Alistair testified that he was trying to fight them off when the shots were fired. I grabbed the gun. And it started going off. I heard Tom holler. She was hollering. Um, like we were swearing about the whole time. We were struggling, and his gun was constantly going off. Alistair says that during the struggle, Tama was fatally shot. Alistair says that when Tama was shot, that's when the assailant fled. Alistair grabs his own gun and tries to shoot the guy, but his gun jammed. Alistair, based on his criminal record and having been under investigation, just did not feel that uh, the police would believe him and would have pointed the finger at him. Alistair said he panicked. He drove Thomas' truck to the funeral home, parked it, and then called Rusty to pick him up. For prosecutors, 
This is the first time they've heard Alistair's version of how the crime went down. And it's a hard pill for them to swallow. That was the most unbelievable story you could ever concoct. Um, it was not feasible. It was not plausible. Even though Alistair's story sounds absurd on the surface, he's a drug dealer. He has a lot of enemies that would maybe want to kill him. His story highlights the fact that the state has yet to prove a motive. With their backs against the wall, prosecutors make a bold gamble of their own and call reluctant witness Jesse Roberts to the stand. I think there was certainly some apprehension about what she would say. But in the end, she decided to tell the truth and explain why this happened. Under oath, Jesse tells the court that Alistair's motive for murdering Tama was simple. There was a very valid and aggressive side to Alistair that no one knew about, not even Tama. Jesse was actually afraid of Alistair. Jesse said that Alistair could fly off the handle in rage in a wink of an eye. He always carried guns. Uh, he was controlling. She said he was jealous. And when he was using drugs, all of this became worse. In the end, Jesse Roberts' testimony proved to be very persuasive and powerful. It showed that the motive in this case was simple. Alistair Couch was a very bad guy. Tama had made a mistake by getting back together with him again. She tried to look the other way on his bad behavior, but just couldn't get past it. And when she called him out on it, he snapped on her and killed her. Jesse's powerful turn on the witness stand, both sides rest their case. It took the jury less than two hours to return a verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant Alistair Couch guilty of murder under instruction number two. They sentenced him to 50 years on the murder and five years enhanced to 10 years on the tampering with physical evidence and the persistent felon and offender charge. So it was 60 years altogether. With Tama's friends and family in the courtroom, the verdict is met with mixed relief. He killed my co-worker and my friend, and, and I don't know why. It was friend, it was co-worker. He didn't get any relief out of it. Justice was served, but it's, it's still with no relief. My child's gone. My baby's not never coming back. Their mama's not coming back. I don't feel justice at all. Because she's still, she's still not here. A lot of people aren't here because... Somebody took her away from us. Even with Alistair Couch behind bars, one burning question lingers. How could Tama Graves, a strong, successful woman trained to help victims against domestic violence, have become a victim herself? She did a lot of domestic violence work, and the ironic thing is, of course, is her death is, is a domestic violence incident. Sometimes we're pushed into helping the very people that we are. The very situations that we in, if I can't get myself out, maybe I can help somebody else. Tama was involved with domestic violence.